Good morning, everyone. As was previously announced, Governor Scott is not participating in today's press conference in deference to the fact that it is Election Day and his sensitivity to media concerns covering this news conference if a candidate was participating. I'm Julie Moore, the Secretary of Natural Resources, and I'm going to kick things off this morning talking with, about uh, school-based winter sports and the guidelines that will be available later this afternoon on the Agency of Education's website. Deputy Secretary of Commerce Ted Brady will then continue and outline guidelines for the operations of our ski areas this winter. And then, because it's Tuesday, Ted will be followed by Commissioner Pichak with his weekly update of modeled COVID trends and the travel map, and then the health update from Dr. Levine. As with school-based fall sports, things will look different this winter. School-based winter sports typically offered in Vermont include Nordic skiing, downhill skiing, snowboarding, basketball, bowling, competitive cheer, dance, gymnastics, hockey, indoor track, and wrestling. Fully appreciating the important physical and mental health benefits school-based sports provide to our student athletes, supporting in-person instruction remains the priority. And as we continue to see clear evidence of just how fragile this can be, with growing case counts and positivity rates, both regionally and also here in Vermont, we are taking necessary precautions. The guidance presents an appropriately cautious approach and was developed with input from health experts and educators, as well as reviewed by the Department of Health and Agency of Education. We know that the risk associated with different sport, types of sports programs is a function of the degree of contact between the participants and the type of setting or format in which the contest is held. Because of this, we were unable to identify ways to sufficiently mitigate the risk for two sports this winter and concluded there simply isn't a way to offer wrestling or indoor track. In addition, because of the increased risk of transmission associated with vocalization, cheerleading squads may not perform vocal routines in practice sessions or competitions during the winter 2021 season. Further, recognizing that gathering indoors inherently presents more health risks than outdoor events and that schools continue efforts to minimize any visitors to their buildings, the guidance establishes that spectators will not be allowed at school-based indoor sports events, practices, or games this winter. This includes basketball, bowling, competitive cheer, dance, gymnastics, and hockey. We recognize this will come as a disappointment to parents and fans of local teams, but minimizing the number of people present is essential to appropriately manage the risk associated with indoor sports events. The masking mandate that was put in place this fall for all players and staff is going to be continued and extended to referees and officials for indoor sports events. The guidance establishes that winter sports practices may begin on or after November 30th, and that teams may initiate interscholastic games, meets, and competitions no earlier than January 11th, 2021. Providing six weeks between the start of practice and the first games is intentional, allowing time for health officials to look for any trends that may emerge and make further adjustments if and as needed. I want to be upfront in highlighting that should data emerge that indicates COVID-19 transmission as a result of sports-related activities, this could result in further delaying or suspending games, practices, meets, and competitions. And finally, as we've seen both locally and in case studies from across the country, COVID transmission often occurs during team-based social gatherings as opposed to the athletic event itself. While team-based social events are often considered an integral part of sports programs in the interest of reducing preventable transmission, the guidance strongly discourages any such in-person team-based social gatherings this winter. And on a more personal note, as a mother, mother of two teenagers, both of whom played soccer this fall, I take seriously the need to do what we can to provide a sense of normalcy in these far from normal times. The guidance represents dozens and dozens of hours of collective work in balancing the health risks associated with COVID against the benefits, the very real benefits, mental and physical, of sporting opportunities for our youth. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Deputy Secretary Brady to talk about ski area guidelines. Thanks so much, Secretary Moore. 
Well, uh, snow is on the ground today, so of course it's time to talk about skiing. So uh, today, the agency of commerce and team development will be uh, actually already has updated our workspace guidance, which is available at accd.vermont.gov, uh, also at vermontvacation.com, uh, to include a new section on Vermont Ski Resort COVID-19 winter operations guidance. Uh, the guidance we're issuing today aims uh, to provide skiers and riders with the safest skiing and riding experience in the country. It aims to ensure the health and safety of the thousands of Vermonters who work in the industry at the mountains, and perhaps most importantly, it aims to protect the health and safety of the communities that host these mountains. Uh, over the past two months, ACCD, the Agency of Commerce, the Department of Health, the uh, Vermont Department of Public Safety, the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources with Secretary Moore's leadership and others worked to develop this guidance. Uh, the end result is what I believe to be the safest and the strongest area guidance in the country. The guidance, as Secretary Moore just said about winter sports guidance, uh, it, it requires people to do things differently. It requires the ski areas to considerably alter uh, how they're going to do business this winter. In addition to following all of the existing health and safety measures in the workspace guidance, ski areas have another layer. So let's be clear, without this guidance, we believe ski areas could have opened under the less restrictive workspace guidance. Today, we're announcing a new layer of security and safety for Vermonters. So what's in it? What's in the guidance? There are several, I'll say six specific areas that add additional layers of safety for the skier, for the workers, and for Vermont. One, and this is an enormous, uh, an enormous undertaking. The guidance requires all customers to attest that they comply with the safe travel and quarantine guidance when they show up at a resort. So when you go to a resort this year, much like going to a hotel, uh, currently, you're going to have to attest that you read, understand, and most importantly, comply the state's existing, with the state's existing travel guidance. Two, another big layer of safety. Ski areas are going to be collecting and maintaining contact tracing information for every guest that's on the mountain every day and to be able to give that information to the Department of Health in the event of a contact tracing need. Three, we're directing ski areas to reduce the reliance on out-of-state staff. So when you think about weekend warriors who come up to do a ski patrol or ski instruction, that commute up from uh, more uh, areas in southern New England and New York, we're asking ski areas to reduce the number of people they rely on to do that. Ski areas are already doing this. They're already trying to reduce the number of people that they need to bring from out-of-state. But this guy just clearly says they have to. Four, lift operations will look different. In addition to managing lift lines a little differently where you're not elbow to elbow and shoulder to shoulder, they're going to have to reduce the capacity of them. The new guidance directs the area to reduce lift capacity to 50%, except for a party traveling together. So let's be clear, if you're a family of four and you're skiing together, you can get on a quad together. But if you're a two-stone or a single, uh, you're not going to be riding that lift with anybody else like this. Enclosed lifts, like gondolas, they're only going to be able to serve a single party unless the gondola is big enough, or the bubble lift is big enough, to ensure six feet between customers and guests. I think a good example of this would be uh, the famous Jay Peak tram. That tram could hold multiple parties in there, and those parties could be six feet apart. A five. It clarifies guidance on base lodges. I think Vermonters know that we have some beautiful base lodges, places that are comfortable, great places to warm up and get a cup of cocoa. The guidance clearly says that ski areas need to reduce day use lodges to 50% fire occupancy, with a maximum of 75 people in any one unique space, no matter how big that one unique space is. Again, 50% fire occupancy or a maximum of 75 people uh, in that space. And then finally, the final thing I want to really highlight is that we've worked with the ski areas to 
ensure that they're operating very lenient cancellation policies to discourage guests who are sick or those impacted by a change in the state's travel policy from coming to Vermont because they're going to lose a few thousand dollars if they don't. Today's area guidance will mean skiing and riding will look different. There is no doubt about it. In addition to six steps, we have about a 10-page uh, guidance document at acpd.vermont.gov, and you can see it at vermontvacation.gov.com, vermontvacation.com also. I need to be clear that this is going to take a lot of preparation and adaptation by both the skiers and the guests in the ski area. Uh, that's one of the reasons why the governor and the Agency of Commerce and the legislature work together to dedicate $2.5 million in ski area safety recreation grants to help ski areas implement safety improvements to their resorts. In light of the fact that we just announced the guidance today, the agency has extended the deadline for that grant program from last week to the end of this week. And ski areas can apply for costs to make safety improvements. I also want to point out that more than a dozen resorts uh, have also taken advantage of the Economic Recovery Grant Program that the Agency of Commerce is running to replace lost revenue. Uh, as I said before, the state worked hard to come up with this guidance, but I want to thank the Vermont Series Association for working with the state to develop the guidance, and especially the president of the Vermont Series Association, Molly Mahar, who has proactively come to us and said, here are some suggestions, what do you think? It worked with us as we went back and forth. Uh, since last spring, it's important to note that our resorts have put Vermont first repeatedly. They voluntarily closed when this pandemic began in March. They put restrictive rules in place over the summer to operate safely, which is worth noting, we did not have major problems at the ski resorts this summer or this fall. And they were operating everything from mountain biking to mountain coasters to uh, we keeping fairly correct. Uh, and the series are proactively you know, approaching us with the framework. I also want to point out that our resorts have uh, already started changing the way they're doing things. Look at Killington. Killington has prided itself for decades on being the first to open and the last to close. They made a strategic decision this year to wait to open until they had enough terrain and enough lifts operating to spread that crowd over their mountains. There are theories around the state that are putting in novel, innovative ideas, such as uh, uh, Bolton, where they're offering uh, ski cabanas so that people don't crowd into the lot. Or theories that have eliminated uh, group lessons, so that you have a private lesson setting only. Uh, before closing, I want to point out that the Vermont Department of Tourism and Marketing is going to work cooperatively with the ski area to educate those who love to play in Green Mountain how to do so safely. We're asking skiers and riders to know before you go. Uh, visitors should visit vermontvacation.com to know how to visit Vermont safely and read the most up-to-date travel guidance. I need to be crystal clear. Our travel guidance is not a suggestion. Our travel guidance is not an idea. Our travel guidance is mandatory restrictions that say you can only come to Vermont if you do these certain things. All skiers and riders are going to have to alter their routine. As Ski Vermont has said already, maybe you want to bring a sandwich this year. Maybe you want to boot up in your car. Maybe you want to uh, make sure you're not skiing alone. Remember, if a lot of singles show up at the ski area, uh, you're going to have a lot of quads with single riders on them. And that's going to create some long lift lines. Most importantly, stay home if you're sick. Uh, Finally, skiing and riding may look different this year. Our guidance aims to do what Vermont's always done best, provide an unparalleled winter experience. In addition to having the best snow, the best resorts, the best free skiing, this year Vermont is going to have the safest skiing and riding season in the country because of this guidance and the cooperation of our ski resorts. We're creating an experience that's safe and healthy for both those on the mountain and even more importantly, those off the mountain. Thank you, Secretary Moore. I hand it back to you. Thank you, Ted. <clears throat> I'll now turn the podium over to Commissioner Pichak, who will present the COVID-19 modeled trends as well as the updated travel map.
Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Moore, and good morning, everybody. Um, as always, you can find our DFR presentations at dfr.vermont.gov, including today's presentation and all past presentations as well. Looking at our first slide, we're looking at new case growth across the country. You can see the story is pretty similar as it has been the last few weeks. We see a clearly defined third peak across the country. Um, you can notice that back in the spring, we had about 32,000 new cases per day across the country. In the summer, when we saw the resurgence, that was about 67,000 per day. Now we're approaching close to 85,000 per day on a seven-day average. So that number continues to rise, um, and it is not showing any signs at the moment of slowing down. On the next side, you, you can see where these cases are spread out across the country. Again, geographically, they're more diverse than they were previously. You can see from a week-to-week -week comparison that we have more cases in places like Utah and Michigan, and even in the Northeast as well. But generally, the story here is that cases are spread out uh, more broadly. Looking a little closer to home in the region, you can see that new case growth is up 23% week over week. We now have 40,000 cases in the region. So again, we're seeing regional increases as well. When we look to all of the other regions across the country, the West, the Midwest, the South, and then also the Northeast, you can see even though we are continuing to increase and increasing at 23%, the rest of the country, the rest of the regions are seeing greater increases than we are in the Northeast. So similar to the summer, uh, similar to the fall, cases are going up everywhere, but they're going up more slowly in the Northeast, even though they're going up more quickly when we compare ourselves to our own experience earlier in the pandemic. Now I wanna show uh, on the next slide um, a time lapse of our travel map. We just saw that cases in the region are going up, therefore that's obviously impacting our travel map. This is uh, something that will be, or is available on our website as well for anyone that's interested in seeing it. But you can see here on the first slide, June 26th, this is the first day that we expanded the travel map to include all of the current states that are in the travel map. You'll notice there are a lot of parts of the region, particularly more rural parts of the region in Ohio and in West Virginia and Virginia and uh, New York and Pennsylvania that had a lot of green. And most of the cases were bunched up in more urban areas. Um, if we time lapse through now, uh, the, the summer and into uh, September, uh, into July 31st rather, you'll see that the travel map already started to change quite dramatically. Those places in Ohio and Virginia and places in Pennsylvania that got swept up with that summer surge quickly turned red and yellow. The number of people that could come to Vermont went from 19 million down to 4.8 million. So again, largely the Northeast was spared from this increase, but certainly that Mid-Atlantic and that Midwest area saw quite a dramatic hit. Now if we fast forward to September 11th, right at the beginning of the fall season, you'll see that there was some slight improvement. We went up to 5.5 million, uh, and we were looking generally good heading into the fall weather. The Northeast looked uh, relatively strong. The Mid-Atlantic, the Midwest could not quite shake the cases that they saw from the summer. They continue to be red and yellow. But again, things change quite dramatically when we now fast forward through today. You can see that today, there is essentially red and yellow everywhere across our travel map. It's on our borders. Uh, it's even in Vermont. 11 of our own 14 counties are above the current threshold uh, for Vermont. That's something that's unique as well. Generally, in past times, we might have had a county or two over our threshold, but now it's quite clear that the cases uh, are in the Northeast. You can see it on the map. Uh, you can see that they're on our borders, and you can see that cases are going up even when comparing within the Vermont borders as well. All of that boils down to the fact that we only had two counties move to green uh, this past week, while 13 moved to red or yellow. That nets out at a decrease of about uh, half a million uh, people that are not uh, no longer eligible to come into Vermont without a quarantine, bringing the travel map number down to 300 and 32,000. So obviously this is the lowest the travel map has been since we published it, and it's down quite considerably from that 19 million number uh, that we started with on June 26th. So quite, um, you know, quite a bit uh, of uh, change, obviously, throughout the summer, but more importantly, quite a bit of change uh, in the fall as it relates to the Northeast and Vermont. 
Talking more specifically about Vermont, we do want to highlight just a few things, you know, because our case counts have stayed higher, but there have been some improvements. You know, we had 132 new cases reported this week. We showed this slide last week with the three different peaks in Vermont. You will notice that now playing it out for another week, uh, that peak that we saw last week that really was on the rise and you weren't quite sure what was going to happen to it, it has at least slowed down and you can see it sort of cresting down. We, we don't know if that obviously even in the short or long term uh, is going to stay in that trajectory, but it is good to see that that has crested at least for now. And then when we compare that to New Hampshire and to Maine on the next slide, you can see that that's not the story that they're experiencing right now. Last week they were seeing case increases and those cases have continued to increase this week. Both New Hampshire and Maine on a seven day average are having more cases now than they did at any other point uh, during the pandemic. So in terms of the Vermont news, this changed our forecast. If you remember last week, the forecast was quite dramatically different because we had seen such dramatic case growth and cases did seem to be trending up. Because they're more stable in the last week, even though they're more elevated, the forecast has improved. It shows that you know we should have a slower level of growth over the next three to six weeks, peaking at about 40 cases a day. But again, just as we said last week, this can change based on Vermonter's behavior both for the good uh, and for the worse. So we certainly want Vermonters to continue all the good public health uh, protocols that are in place. Looking ahead on the week over week comparison across Vermont, the only thing we wanted to point out was that Coas County in northern New Hampshire uh, has been seeing a dramatic increase in cases. In Vermont, we saw four cases in Essex County, a very small county for us, and we've never had that many cases reported there in one week. So maybe there is some spillover from what's happening uh, in New Hampshire. That's obviously a community that's quite, um, uh, you know, it's one community in some of those places up there in the Northeast Kingdom. So just a reminder for those that live in the Northeast Kingdom be, to be careful and cautious about traveling to that part of New Hampshire now, uh, whether for essential or non-essential reasons. Now, again, all of this put into context, even though cases continue to be on the rise across the country in the region and to some degree, in Vermont, things like hospitalizations and deaths remain very low. Uh, you'll see here in Vermont uh, that we had a slight uptick, although it's pretty minor and we've had similar upticks in other parts of the summer in terms of our hospitalization and ICU usage. So nothing that really stands out for concern. And then when we compare that to ourselves, to, our, to the national average uh, and to northern New England, you can see just how good shape we are here in Vermont compared to the national average. You can see hospitalizations are going up nationally, but in Vermont, they're pretty minuscule, and this is on a per capita basis. Uh, and Northern New England as a whole is performing quite well on this metric. Similarly, when you look at fatalities, you know, those are going up nationally, but again, in Northern New England, and particularly in Vermont, those remain very low, fortunately. On the next slide, you'll see that, in fact, this week, for the first time, we can confidently say that we have the lowest fatality rate in the country since the start of the pandemic. Uh, again, obviously good news uh, from that perspective. So it's not, all, um, it's not all bad news in terms of what's happening uh, in northern New England and Vermont, but it is certainly cause for concern when you see cases because that's a leading indicator. Hospital and deaths, unfortunately, are sort of a lagging indicator in terms of uh, the result that you might see from those case growth. In terms of the restart metrics, we'll just mention they're all trending favorably. There's no need to call out one in particular. I'll just mention, though, that in terms of positivity, we do remain uh, to have the lowest positivity rate in the country. So again, everywhere is seeing some, uh, some impact from the spread of the virus. We're seeing it here in Vermont, but we continue to stand out when compared uh, to our peers locally uh, and nationally as well. Just a couple of other updates on flu data. You'll see that we just got over 150,000 Vermonters vaccinated as of last week. Uh, we are about 50% to our goal for vaccination, uh, so we continue to see a good uptick in the, uh, in the flu vaccine. I want to encourage everyone to still get their vaccine. Everyone that can avoid getting the flu, avoid spreading it to someone else, avoid a hospitalization uh, will be helpful to all of us as we enter into the later fall and winter potential surge for COVID-19. Last on the K-12 through and higher ed update, you'll see that um, Vermont added about 14 cases to its K through 12 case count this past week. Uh, New Hampshire added about 55 cases. Maine 
23 cases. So we continue to trend favorably when compared to the rest of northern New England. And then last, when we look at the higher ed numbers, Vermont added 36 new cases this week, most of those associated with St. Michael's College. Uh, beyond St. Michael's College, the numbers are really stable in the higher education space. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you. I'll start off by saying I hope everybody had a happy Halloween. I was glad to see and hear about all the creative ways Vermonters found to trick or treat safely. From Halloween themed face masks to decorated tables and candy slides, Vermonters showed they understand how to protect each other. We can follow the guidance and still have fun. Some of those ideas may even become a more permanent part of our Halloween traditions. Let's all keep that creativity in mind as we navigate the coming months of the pandemic. The kids in our neighborhood said it was one of the best Halloweens ever, and their parents said the same. Everyone was at the end of their driveways, physically distanced across tables and decorations, but very socially connected. Now I also know that some people may have had different Halloween celebrations, Maybe what was supposed to be a small gathering was a little more crowded than you expected. Or maybe you just slipped and ended up in a riskier situation at a party or in a bar. If that's the case, I'm not here to yell at you. We're all human. But please know that it's not too late to protect people around you. Consider staying closer to home for a while and avoid seeing anyone who's at higher risk of uh, COVID-19. And after seven days have passed, it's a good idea to get tested. So you might want to plan that out now. As much as we want to avoid these kinds of high-risk situations, they are going to happen. And the more we can acknowledge them, the greater chance we have of stopping any potential spread of the virus. Speaking of higher risk, let's return again to that travel map that we just saw. I know that a sea of red isn't what any of us want to see right now. We are tired of this pandemic. Maybe we're just trying to tune out the bad news now. We miss our family and friends, and we just want to look ahead to joyful holiday traditions together. But unfortunately, as the map tells us, we need to face the reality of our current situation. The latest surge of coronavirus cases is hitting many parts of the country including the Northeast. We're seeing a rollback of reopening plans, restrictions being imposed in various states. Here in Vermont, we continue to see more cases reported every day and growing numbers of small outbreaks. As I've said before, Vermont is not safe from COVID-19. It's our job to keep each other as safe as we can. That's why, as we make our holiday plans, it's probably a good idea to avoid travel if you can. Travel will increase your chance of getting and spreading COVID-19. That same message applies to any visitors you may be inviting to your home who come from outside of Vermont. Those visitors would need to quarantine in your home, including your returning college student. I want to emphasize that quarantining in someone else's home does not just mean you can't go out to the store. If your guests are in quarantine, they should wear a mask in common places, use a separate bathroom, eat separately. That's really important to note if a Thanksgiving meal is being planned. Stay six feet apart and otherwise not be in close contact with other household members. You can find more information like this on our newly updated webpage regarding isolation and quarantine. Without taking these steps, you could easily be exposed to COVID by one of your visitors who unknowingly brought the virus into your home because they didn't know they were infected and might be in their pre-symptomatic period. 
If you do leave Vermont, remember that you need to quarantine for 14 days when you return, so plan ahead. Of course, you can also get a negative test after seven days and quarantine early if you have no symptoms and end your quarantine early. We know that social gatherings, often among trusted family and friends, are a driving force behind much of the virus's spread right now across the nation. Adding the element of travel to the mix only adds to the risk. Celebrating the holidays at home will be different for many people this year, but maybe like Halloween, we can come up with some new holiday traditions and innovations. Maybe even a few we'll want to keep. And we can be thankful we're all doing our part to protect one another. Since today is election day, if you haven't voted yet, you can still drop your ballot off or vote in person safely as all voting sites through Vermont have integrated specific public health guidance into their protocols this year. Now to move to cases and outbreaks. We continue to see daily totals of cases in the teens and 20s. Some days, though, heavily influenced by our ongoing Central Vermont hockey outbreak, or as it has, as it has become to be called, though more accurately, ice sports teams, Washington County. As of last night, there were a total of 112 cases. I've noted previously there were six schools that had in some small way been impacted beyond the Union Elementary School. We told you we'd report on which schools they were, and they were South Burlington High School, Williston Central School, Francis C. Richmond Middle School, Barry Elementary, Montpelier High School, and Oxbow High School. But the major impact from this outbreak, of course, currently, has of course been St. Michael's College. The total count there is now 65, 17 having been reported yesterday after campus-wide testing. Fortunately, the majority of cases on this campus have been asymptomatic. The campus remains on remote learning. Now we can move on to the uh, question period. Um, just a reminder for everybody who is not here, we do have our subject matter expertise, but please keep the questions in there. We have real houses. To start with Calvin. Uh, thank you. So I just have a, a quick clarifying question about the ski guidance. I know some individual resorts were doing reservations. Um, is the state going to be requiring reservations ahead of time, or can I go up to the ski first? Sure, leave that one my way, because it's at Brady's from the Agency of Commerce. Uh, the guidance does not require a reservation system for, uh, for skiers. So some resorts have implemented those, and uh, basically we're telling resorts, uh, here are the frame, here are the, here are the guidelines that you need to operate within to reduce uh, capacity in your lodges on your lifts and other places. And ski resorts are going to take different approaches to meet that guidance. So no, there is no state requirement that you have to have a reservation before you go to a ski resort. Uh, you're going to want to check with your resort ahead of time to see uh, what policies that resort is putting in place to comply with our guidance. And then I guess uh, a quick follow-up to, I mean, there's lots of red counties around. Um, how are we going to make sure that people are actually following the quarantine rules, right? I mean, we've already heard from some owners of hotels and D&Ds over the summer that there were, you know, visitors that weren't, that they were basically lying on the, uh, the, the honor form. So I'm, I'm just wondering how, how we enforce that. Sure. Well, one, we need to do a, a big education campaign. Uh, and the Department of Tourism is working with the CRS marketing money that was uh, afforded to it by the legislature and the governor asked for. And we're going to be do some, doing a lot of marketing to make sure people know what our travel policy is. That's, that's the number one thing. Uh, two, the ski areas are doing the same. Uh, in addition to uh, an educational campaign, they're also requiring you buy your ticket, that you attest, that you have read and understand and comply with the state uh, travel guidance. This is the most restrictive policy in the country when it comes to, uh, you know, 
the resort interaction with the pier. So we're putting in place a level of protection that other states are not. In addition to that, we're asking carriers to hold piers accountable so that if piers don't do this, they have to be sent back, but also that there are ramifications for not doing that. The existing guidance specifically speaks to that, saying that your skiing and riding privileges could be revoked if you violate the state's travel guidance. And then just one quick follow-up as well on the winter sports pool guidance. Yes. You mentioned that the state is highly discouraged in gathering off the ice and off the court. I'm wondering if there will be any disciplinary action, if that's in the guidance or if that's something that the district has to plan. So the Vermont Principals Association, the VPA, is going to be issuing a companion guidance document with a lot more details on their expectations around conduct for teams. I expect that guidance document will be released later this week. You're welcome. Siri? Dr. Levine, what do you say to the people who are kind of frustrated right now with the quarantine rules? I mean, you guys have said this is one of the most restrictive in the country. So what do you have to say to people who are a little bit frustrated with the rules right now? Let me be clear. The thing that's most restrictive is what Deputy Secretary Brady was talking about with regard to the policy around the ski industry's interaction with the customer and the need for quarantine. But quarantine as a public health measure is pretty standard around the country. And just so I can reassure Vermonters, we're actually on the more progressive side, if I could use that word, because we do provide this opportunity to test out on day seven of what otherwise would be a 14-day quarantine. And if you add in the couple of days that it might take to get your test result back, you're still significantly shorter time than 14 days. So it's a pretty progressive policy that has really stood up over time very well here in Vermont and allowed a lot of people a lot more freedom without endangering anybody in the population in terms of new disease exposure. This is kind of self-serving, I guess, but in the school sports guidance, I can imagine there's going to be a lot of pushback a little bit on the parents' side not being able to attend games and things like that. What about covering these games for us? So we are looking at what opportunities and tools there might be available to promote broadcasting games online, on TV, or even on the radio. I know that some local access channels have been providing that service throughout the fall because there have been limitations on the number of spectators allowed to attend games. And we're looking right now at ways we might be able to bolster and further support that sort of activity. You're welcome. Moving to the phones, we'll start with Lisa from the AP. Thank you. This is a question for Ted Brady. Do you know how Vermont's ski policy compares to New Hampshire and Maine? And if there are major differences? Sure, there are major differences. So perhaps the most notable is the base lodge area and the requirements to have a capped number to be in line with our social distancing, our maximum gathering size of 75. That's perhaps the most notable. But also, as I said before, neither of the other states are requiring this attestation that people are meeting the travel guidance. And our lift guidance is a little different. The capacity restrictions in our lift guidance is a little more restrictive. Okay, thank you. All right, Lisa Loomis, the Valley Reporter. Good morning. My question is also about the ski resort attestation. The resort must require guests to attest that they're in compliance with the state's travel policy for point-of-sale tickets and when purchasing a pass. Why aren't only ski resorts and lodging establishments required to do this when 
restaurants, retail shops, grocery stores, and other states have similar requirements? Sure. Well, first, let's realize that the hospitality sector has been uh, the most impacted sector of this crisis, as the governor said again and again. And that's why we've stood up these economic recovery grant programs to recognize that. We also recognize the hospitality sector and the ski resort are in the unique position of drawing a lot of people to Vermont. And it is the place where out of staters interact with other Vermonters. So it makes sense that these are the places where we put these additional travel safety measures in place because we know these are the places where travelers come to. We know these are the places where we can interact with that traveler, educate that traveler, and make sure that traveler is in fact complying with our guidance. So, so the obvious reason is this is where out of staters go. So we're catching them at the point of contact uh, when they come here to the state. And then as a follow-up, can resorts legally suspend or cancel people's passes, in particular if the attestation requirement was not in place when they were purchased, many people purchased their ski passes last spring, this summer, or earlier this fall, before this requirement existed? Does this have teeth? Uh, sure. Well, I, I think, uh, I, I certainly think it does. Uh, ski resorts have the right to uh, suspend service to people uh, who violate a whole host of rules, whether you're skiing out of bounds or skiing unsafely or uh, as we've seen in past circumstances, uh, poor behavior that's uh, not conducive to uh, the resort operating safely. It's safe to say that if you violate our travel policy, you're putting Vermonters at risk, you're putting the people that work at the ski area at risk, and you're putting our communities at risk. So uh, we certainly believe that this, uh, you, you could suspend somebody's right to uh, ski and ride uh, based on and unsafe behavior. Thank you. Pat, WCAS. Good morning. We've had 464 cases in the past month, which is 21% of all the COVID cases that we've had since the start of the pandemic. And in just the past two weeks, we've had 273 cases, which is 12% of all the cases since the pandemic started, and 136 of those were in the past seven days alone. At what point do you become alarmed by the rising numbers? And what is the benchmark for implementing new restrictions? What's the number on that? Hi, Kat. Dr. Levine here. Thanks for those questions. Um, numbers of that magnitude in Vermont always uh, pique our interest, needless to say. I don't want to use the word alarmed. Um, because such a substantial proportion of those numbers that you just recited are with this one major outbreak. Um, we went through a similar experience, uh, as you saw on the graph, with that sort of second peak that we had on our curve, which was the burlington Winooski outbreak that had well over 100 people in it as well. Um, the, Nice downslope that Commissioner Pichak just showed us at the end of the graph, uh, hopefully will be the beginning of a trend um, because we actually are not seeing a lot of spread of this uh, Central Vermont ice sports teams uh, outbreak in other sectors. It's mainly limited to the uh, St. Michael's College now and there are great measures instituted on this campus to make sure that those numbers don't uh, grow substantially more. So we would hope that when that outbreak itself uh, tails off and comes to an end, we'll see much more of uh, what we expect to see, which is an increase in cases over where we've been over the summer, but not an increase to the degree we've experienced that uh, you just mentioned in the last several weeks. Uh, and that's where I would hope, in an optimistic uh, frame, we would settle out. Now, with regard to your second question about what would push us to do more, um, one thing would push us would be if any of those four metrics that Commissioner Pichak appropriately kind of brushed over today because they're not alarmingly changing in any one way. We still have the lowest positivity rate. Our hospitalizations went up a little notch and that's it. Um, so, you know, and the other two metrics likewise. So they're not approaching the so-called guardrails that we would be concerned about. That's one thing. 
But there's part of this game that isn't just reacting to data, it's being proactive. And we want to be exceedingly proactive. The SKI guidance that we've just been hearing a lot of questions about and discussion on is a great example of that. It's like we need to open the ski industry. We want to. People will need that for their physical and mental health. People will want to be outdoors in the winter doing something like that. And there is a way to do it. However, the way to do it is not the way we've done it every year for the last century. It's going to be a very novel way, just like Halloween was different this year. So we're trying to be proactive with, their, with that guidance to uh, be an example, if you will, of the kinds of things we want to watch out for. And the things we want to watch out for, which I've messaged a little bit today, are an inordinate degree of travel that would not involve quarantine, because pretty much you've seen the map, all travel involves quarantine at this point. And the other thing would be the size of gatherings, because we know that this virus thrives when people are close together in crowded settings, and add to that, questions about ventilation, and it would be even worse. So that's the science behind the virus and the kinds of guidance that we're proactively uh, talking about here today. But nothing further than that if you're uh, thinking, because again, none of our guardrails are really being approached, and the data doesn't support us getting super aggressive uh, as a reaction to the recent increase in cases. And I'll just ask a very quick follow-up. And you're confident that those four guardrails are the four metrics the state needs to look at to be confident that rising cases are not a concern? They're the fundamental four. We actually, we actually look at more than that. Uh, but um, we certainly want to respect those the most, I think, in a hierarchy of guardrails. And if Commissioner Petrick wants to say any more, he can. But you know, that's really a hierarchy of guardrails. Those are the four that are the most critical for us to watch. But again, we want to be preemptive and proactive too. So um, sometimes without a guardrail, we'll do something like you just heard with the ski industry, um, which is more restrictive than it's been in the past, but I think passes the it's reasonable test to most observers. Thank you. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, this is for Secretary Brady. I have a question about the capacity sizes of the ski resorts and also the beverage service. Uh, Ted, I, I, just to be clear, so the maximum inside a ski lodge would be 75 regardless of the fire capacity. Is that correct? Uh, close. It's 50% of your fire occupancy uh, with no more than 75. So let's say that your fire occupancy is only 100. You could only have 55 even though we have that 75 upper limit. But if your fire capacity was 500, you could only have 75. Really important to know that most of our ski lodges, though, are not one single space. You might have a big space upstairs, a big space downstairs. And both of those would be considered unique individual spaces that you could have up to 75 in each. Um, the other question I had was, uh, the ski areas are pretty much have, have pretty solid plans on, on their food and beverage services. And obviously very important to their economy uh, because we all know how much of a damage of the beer costs to the ski resort, frankly. If, if they have outdoor uh, tent, you know, heated tent, something like that, what is the, the procedure, what is the, the limitation on the capacity for those? Sure, so it looks the same as uh, the indoor spaces. So, you know, when you, when you have a, if you add additional space outside, put up a tent, you're likely going to have walls. The tent has walls that's an indoor space, so you couldn't have more than 75 people uh, with an asterisk of no more than 50% of your fire occupancy of that outdoor space. Uh, if a ski lodge is operating as a restaurant, so uh, where they're, you know, they actually have table service, they should operate as a restaurant guide. You know, takeout is a little bit of a different story. If it's a takeout meal, you could take it to one of your spaces, but the space needs to still be managed to no more than 50% occupancy uh, and no more than 75 people per state. Now, when, when the governor issued the, the original restaurant guidance, he, he allowed for uh, basically cocktails to go. Is, 
is that same, would be that same sort of policy uh, on alcohol service? I, I, I'm not familiar enough with how, uh, what type of permits each of these ski resorts has, but yes, the, the, the restaurant guidance applies to a restaurant service. So if, if they have a liquor license and they're able to serve liquor, uh, they'd be able to follow the same rules other restaurants could follow. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Hello. I think this is probably for Dr. Levine, but I've been wrong before. Um, I know that um, well before the very large increase in the number of cases of COVID around the country, um, you were already predicting some kind of um, increase in Vermont just due to people coming indoors. Um, I understand uh, the spike in um, Washington County, you know, the causes of that. And similarly, um, the discussion earlier on suggested that there might be some spillover from Coas County into Essex County. But for the remainder of um, the increase in cases, do you see that as simply what you were expecting in the first place? Or is that more reflective of the large scale increase in the states around us, all of them? Um, and in that case, is does that suggest that people are not um, following the quarantine restrictions properly? Yeah, so you've, you've loaded a lot into that. Um, so we're, you're, you're correct. We did predict there would be more cases uh, as the fall and winterish weather <coughs> made itself apparent because of people moving indoors. We do have some concerns on the part of the map that Commissioner Pichak showed uh, from Essex County adjoining a hotter area in New Hampshire. And we also uh, notice um, what's happening in the map in general, all, all the states around us, uh, with significant increases in cases. Um, Southern New England particularly, but uh, even Maine and New Hampshire now are both uh, reporting uh, much different levels of caseloads than they have previously, um, with some attendant increase in hospitalizations as well. So lately what we've noticed in Vermont is that um, we have very small clusters or when the cluster qualifies for an outbreak, outbreaks that might be occurring at a work site, at a daycare, at a healthcare facility, uh, here and there, uh, but very small numbers. Um, I, I could use the word randomly, but um, you know, not, not in a very coherent fashion. Um, we do know that if you look at, for instance, uh, all the cases over the course of a month, that we understand for cases that we understand where there might have been an association, because about half of the cases it's hard to know, but where we do know, household contacts play the biggest role. And it's almost always family or roommates or extended family, much less likely small numbers, friends, things of that sort. And then second to that uh, is travel. Sometimes there are multiple reasons, so it's hard to sort them out clearly. Um, but that's sort of how it plays out recently. And again, the expectation was being indoors just provides more of an environment that the virus thrives in with regard to the drier weather, the ventilation, the tendency to be crowded, sometimes to not have a mask on if you're with familiar people, um, all of that. Uh, so those are the expectations for this kind of weather this time of year, and I wouldn't expect that to change markedly. But again, it's a matter of trying not to let your guard down at every moment 
because that one time you do could put you in the situation where um, you might actually contract the virus or endanger somebody else. Did I get to the crux of your question, Joe? Uh, I think so. Uh, I have just one other follow-up, which is given that um, 11 of Vermont counties, if they weren't in Vermont, would be considered areas that um, one would need to quarantine if, if you visited, um, are there special additional precautions other than what you've been talking about before that people should take if they live in these areas? No, I think the, the precautions apply no matter where you live, whether it's even in Vermont or outside Vermont, uh, but certainly we only have control for what we as Vermonters do with inside Vermont. Um, and again, there's a brilliant team taking care of this pandemic here. But I want to say that nothing we're telling Vermonters is rocket science. Stay home when you're sick. Personal hygiene, like hand washing. Physical distancing, but social connectivity. Wearing masks and not getting into crowded situations indoors. It really can be distilled down to that simple. Um, and until we have um, you know, more vaccine availability and uh, we can have another sort of quiver in our arrows here, in our bows. Um, the fact is we need to follow these dual paths, getting hopefully vaccines that are safe and effective approved, getting them into the state, starting to have uptake by the population. But while that's going on, everybody doing all the things I just said. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Aaron at VT Digger. Uh, can you hear me, okay? Yes. Okay. Um, the uh, CDC put out a, a guidance, I guess you could call it, saying that people with symptoms of COVID 19 or even people who are quarantined with the virus should still be able to go out and go in person. <laughs> I was wondering, if Dr. Levine, if you had any thoughts on the safety of that. I did see that the Secretary of State's website um, published guidance saying if you have symptoms, stay at home and contact the town clerk before election day to arrange a ballot. Uh, but uh, I don't know if you had any, any thoughts on, on that guidance versus what the CDC is saying. Yeah, I was, um, frankly, myself a little surprised at the CDC guidance, but. Uh, they're, they're trying to do the right thing for the majority of people, some of whom might not avail themselves <clears throat> of the opportunity to vote if they didn't remove themselves from quarantine to do that. So what they're doing is saying <clears throat> essentially that the voting experience in 2020 has been made so public health aware and public health conscious and had so much guidance built in that if you abide by that, you, and they even said you can let people at the polling station know uh, that you want to be sort of separate from other people, that you can actually continue to be distanced, continue to be masked, avoid being anywhere near a bunch of people, and certainly not in a crowd, and kind of do your business um, and move on. Um, that seemed to me, um, I guess, parsimonious may be the word. Um, certainly allowing people to go a little further than we usually guide them with quarantine, uh, but making sure they understood that it was going to be as safe an experience as possible. Yeah, would you compare it to the protests where, you know, there were concerns about the size of gatherings, but people said, well, this is important for democracy, and we can't, like, limit people to them, right? So. Yeah, it's hard for me to compare it to that because, um, here, people are exercising their right to vote. There, they're exercising their right to be in a protest. But putting yourself in a protest does endanger yourself and others who are in contact with you uh, to a much greater degree because of the crowding and the inability to socially distance at all times, uh, even though I know people wore masks pretty consistently. Um, so that's a little bit higher risk. 
and um, not as considerate of your fellow citizen, if you will, as what the CDC envisioned the voting experience would look like. Yeah. Um, I know with the uh, protests, there was a lot of concern that they could become super spreader events. My understanding is that they didn't really pan out, but I mean, you could correct me on that if I'm wrong. Um, but uh, given what we're seeing now with the like online polls in other states and um, you know the potential difficulty people are having with mail voting and the desire to go vote in person, are you concerned that you see? Um, you know, basic function of our democracy could become, unfortunately, Yeah, there's always a concern about that, but I think um, the fact that compliance with all of the basic guidance is part of the deal makes it much less likely. <clears throat> and if I could compare, for instance, the protests where I really, you know, I, again, my guide is other state health officials and the, watching the television, everybody was really trying to stay distance as they could and wearing a mask consistently. If I could contrast that with uh, South Dakota and the Sturgis motorcycle uh, event, where it's been now well proven that through God knows how many states, numerous, numerous cases have arisen from that event. That was at an event where people actually were completely discarding the public health guidance. There was no such thing as a physical distance. There was no such thing for many as masking. So there are very different kinds of experiences, and I guess it shows you that an outdoors event that's done well uh, can actually not turn into a super spreader event, whereas one that is done poorly with little regard for compliance uh, can become a disaster. Okay, thank you very much, that's all. Eric, the Times Argus. Yes, this is for Commissioner Shirley. Uh, polls have been open for uh, a few hours now. Any issues to report? Any voter intimidation? Anything? Any issues of people trying to vote? Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, no, uh, so far, a knock on wood, uh, all has been well as we anticipate here in Vermont. Um, we're in consistent contact with uh, agencies around the state and the Secretary of State's office, and so far, nothing to report. Okay, thank you. Avery, WCAX. Dr. Levine, the American Society for Microbiology did a survey of various labs across the country, and they reported that there was a shortage of commercial test kits for COVID-19, as well as test kits for strep throat, pneumonia, bronchitis, some um, sexually transmitted infection. What have you been seeing in terms of the testing supplies, and how is it affecting Vermont? Yeah, I haven't uh, seen the exact survey you're uh, referring to, but we are concerned actually about testing supplies for another area of public health, which is sexually transmitted infections. And we've actually just been sending out some guidance regarding that to the clinical community. But with regard to the COVID and other respiratory kind of pathogen testing, um, I know that has been a concern. We, uh, as you know, have been adopting a policy internally of stockpiling as much as we can. The other policy we've had is diversifying uh, the portfolio of test platforms we have throughout the state. And we've recently acquired uh, for five of the uh, hospitals across the state that did not have testing capacity, we've acquired um, Cepheid platforms for them for testing, and they're all undergoing um, installation and training as we speak right now. And um, we've also gotten from the manufacturer some assurance regarding a supply of the actual reagents that'll be needed uh, to manage that platform. So um, nothing alarming happening in Vermont at this point in time, but obviously we're always uh, a little nervous about that based on what the country went through back in March, and we don't want that situation to arise again. Thank you. John, VPR. Hello. Um, I, I have a question about ski areas. Uh, I, it seems like looking at the travel map and listening to the guidance about ski areas, there's 
sort of a discordance here. Um, the travel map would seem to indicate that only people from northern Maine and maybe a county in New York and maybe one in Pennsylvania could come here without quarantining uh, for 14 days or seven days and getting a test. And the ski areas are hoping to have as much business as usual. But they draw from the places that are all in the red. Realistically, what kind of ski season based on out-of-state business can we expect? It's a, it's a huge industry, as you know, billion dollars in wages and almost 400 million in taxes in Vermont. And I'm wondering, you know, really, I guess this is for Ted. Um, how can how can the skiers have these, uh, or how can it, how can skiers follow this guidance and actually come here and ski? Sure, thanks. Uh, the the most important uh, piece of this is that you're right that people should be quarantined if they're coming from a red county before coming to Vermont, uh, and that's a very real opportunity that Vermont affords people. You can quarantine at your home for 14 days or for seven days in test and then come straight to Vermont by personal vehicle. So despite the status of the travel map, there is a way to get here. Uh, you know, it's, it's worth the quarantine, folks. If you want to come to Vermont, it's worth working from home for a week. It's worth finding a way to come here. But uh, we fully recognize that the travel policy is going to lead to less people being able to come here. And we expect here is to have a decreased uh, uh, customer count. If you look at a place like JP, they, de they depend upon uh, a plurality of their customers to cross the international border to come to their ski resort. That border is closed right now. Will it be closed in two months? I don't know for sure. Uh, when you look at places down in southern Vermont, those counties likely will be red for a little while or yellow. So we're asking people to plan ahead. If you want to come here for Christmas break, uh, you need to quarantine before coming here. We recognize that ski areas are going to have a difficult year economically. That's why we've created the Economic Recovery Grant Program that gives up to $300,000 per business to replace lost revenue due to COVID-19. It's why we created the $2.5 million ski area safety grant program. Uh, and that's not enough, but that's why we've done those programs, because the travel policies, the pandemic, is going to impact the bottom line of our ski areas. I will say that when we look at outdoor recreation across the country, it has boomed in the pandemic. Vermonters are hiking more, Vermonters are biking more, Vermonters are boating more. We think Vermonters will ski more. So this could be the year to take up skiing if you're a Vermonter. And John, Great. I might just... Sorry, I might just ask sure, Commissioner, sure. Commissioner Pichak to just quickly um, just give a reminder about the travel map and how it changes weekly. It's not static. So that might be the full answer, but just a quick, just to your point about the question of the travel map this week um, and the ski season being a few more months. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, yeah. we, the ski resorts may open more you know, in the near future. I know the guidance is out and the snow is on the ground, but. The map obviously updates every week. We'll see what happens regionally. You know, we've seen these peaks, um, you know, really uh, with rapid rises and then things, people settle down, behavior changes, and they get things under control and, and we do see improvements. So hopefully we see that in the Northeast, but, um, you know, also as Ted mentioned, quarantining before you come to Vermont is a real option as well. And again, it's up to the ski resort to get the, the sort of affirmation from the visitor that, that he or she has done so. You know, that's the enforcement on this. Uh, it, well, that's really the education and uh, compliance, point of compliance where we're going to ask people. And when, uh, if there is ever an event that needs to be followed up on, uh, we'd look to the ski area to present those attestations. And uh, if we find that somebody hasn't followed those attestations, uh, there, there are repercussions. The, the most notable one in the existing guidance is the loss of skiing and riding privileges at, at, that, at that resort going forward. Thank you. Liz, the Burlington Free Press. Hi there. I have a few questions on the ski guidance as well. Um, my 
first question is, um, you know, we've seen a couple of ski resorts put out um, their own, um, I guess, rules and regulations for the upcoming ski season. And one of them is uh, some of them are requiring reservations. I wonder if that's going to be required for all ski resorts um, or if people can go to the mountain the same day. Sure, uh, the existing guidance does not require mountains to put reservation systems in place. It requires them to uh, make the capacity reductions we've talked about. Some of them have decided, and anticipated this, decided that the reservation policy is the best way, but no, it does not require a reservation policy. Okay. I also wanted to ask about the um, attestation uh, that, that people have read and understand the state's travel guidance when they sign up for a ticket. Um, it kind of sounds to me like, you know, the people who click the box that, that says they understand the terms of condition, terms and conditions for whatever they're signing up for. So I guess I, I wonder what the, I guess the enforceability of that is um, and whether you are um, anticipating that people will actually follow um, and, and follow through and, and do that. Yeah, we, we do anticipate people will actually say uh, the truth and attest to the truth. This isn't a 10 page document. This isn't a real complicated thing. It says if you're from an area that has a high COVID case count, you need to quarantine before you came here, or you need to plan to quarantine when you get here. Uh, that's a lot simpler than the legalese that you read uh, uh, on those disclosures. Uh, as far as kind of, as far as actual enforceability, yes, part of this is an education campaign. Uh, Let's not pretend like everybody understands and goes to uh, vermontvacation.com or accd.vermont.gov to learn about the travel policy. We need to educate people. What better time to educate them than where they're about to make a purchase to come to Vermont, to ski in Vermont. Uh, we've put a, a, real, uh, a, a real consequence of breaking that policy in the guidance. Uh, and we'll uh, look to enforce it through that policy. This is a living document. You know, if things get worse, our guidance is going to get stricter. If things get better, perhaps our guidance will get more relaxed. But right now, where we are today, given the state of the virus, this is the safest way for us to open the resort. Thank you. I also have a question about the winter sports guidance. Um, I wonder if, whether the experience from um, fall sports influenced any of the decisions for the winter sports guidance? Like, did things go according to that plan? And um, did the experience make um, the thought of having winter sports so more conceivable? Certainly, uh, for school-based fall sports, we think that overall they were, were highly successful. Um, we know that, that athletes had concerns about some of the modifications that had been proposed, particularly for football and volleyball, um, but in the end, I, I think that those athletes that chose to participate had an enjoyable experience. Uh, we're also learning from our experiences uh, related to recreational sports, in particular the Central Vermont outbreak that Dr. Levine referred to. Um, as we move indoors with school-based sports, um, looking for ways to, to take some lessons learned and additional mitigation measures um, in an endeavor to ensure that those sport activities remain safe um, and that kids can remain in school. Thank you. Guy Page. Guy, Chronicle of the Vermont State House. All right, we'll move to Mike Donahue, the Islander. This is a question for Ed Brady, I think. So, uh, if somebody violates the rules and say uh, get kicked out of the cell, <clears throat> what's stopping them from uh, moving down to uh, Bolton or Sugarbush? Uh, are the resorts going to be able to uh, share the names of people that uh, are violating the rules? Sure, that's not uh, contemplated in the guidance, uh, largely because uh, you know, this is about educating people about what our travel policy is. 
So asking people to do the honorable thing and tell us uh, whether or not they've complied. And then we do have an accountability measure in place. Our, our problem is not going to be that a few people sneak through. Our, our problem is going to be if people don't understand what the expectation is, they can never live up to that expectation. We're setting a crystal clear expectation. We're educating people about that expectation. And we're putting measures in place that can hold you accountable if you violate that expectation. If they've invested a considerable amount of money to rent a, a condo and, and maybe rent keys, whatever, uh, they aren't likely to want to give that up very quickly without taking another shot at another resort. I think. Well, what we hope is that people will see our guidance, understand our guidance, and make plans around that. So, hey, this is a great time to start remote working from Vermont for the winter. This is a great time to uh, look into Vermont real estate and move to Vermont. But uh, we certainly understand people are making big investments. We, that's part of the reason we're requiring resorts to offer liberal cancellation policies. When you look through the resorts right now, you see so many of them have past protection plans that allow for a refund if the area can't operate or can't open, all of these things on those lines. Um, but, uh, you know, we can't, can't account for every possibility, but I think we've done a pretty good job of trying to protect Vermonters and trying to protect the people that work in the area and trying to provide a safe ski and riding experience in Vermont. And, and the other question is, uh, so I know that you're saying uh, the resorts are being encouraged not to uh, hire out-of-state uh, workers, the uh, ski patrollers for the weekend, whatever. Um, did the state contemplate uh, putting like a percentage on the number of out-of-state employees, like 10% in an effort to really give guidance to the ski resorts or are they realizing that they've got to operate and need people there? They're gonna make a good faith effort, but the reality is they may, may end up with a considerable amount of out-of-state employees coming in. Yeah, we've worked with the ski area to identify how many they normally have coming in, and all of them have said we intend to reduce that number, period. So uh, the goal here is to reduce the risk, and I think the existing policy that we just announced will reduce that risk. We're also, the policy reminds people who are coming here to work, whether it's at ski areas or not, because our current travel guidance allows people to come to Vermont for authorized work without quarantining. If you're coming to work, that's what you're coming to do. You're, you don't have an exemption to go socialize. You don't have an exemption to go to the bar. You don't have an exemption to go live it up in Vermont while you're here for work. Uh, and so we're, that, that's another thing we're asking ski resorts to remind their employees. If you're coming up to patrol, which let's be clear, a ski area cannot operate if it doesn't have the right amount of ski patrollers. They can't run the lift. They can't provide the service they need to and the resort couldn't open. So they're clearly essential workers. But when they're here essentially doing essential work, we're saying, please, uh, you, you need to you need to step back and, and put Vermonters first. You've trained to be a life-saving professional that goes out into negative 15 degree weather and fixes people's femurs. We think you probably care enough to not spread COVID-19 across Vermont. One, and one clarification for Secretary Moore, are, are middle schools excluded or excluded and if excluded, why not equal treatment for them? Uh, no, uh, middle schools are included under the school-based sports guidance. Also understanding that in some communities, um, elementary and middle school programs are run through recreational de recreation departments as opposed to being administered by school districts. Uh, the recreational sports guidance specifically speaks to recreational sports programs that take place in a school building. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you very much, Thank you. Tom, VT Digger. Tom, VT Digger. All right, we're going to move to Ed, Newport Daily Express. Ed, Newport Daily Express. Okay, we'll move to Allen, the Vermont Standard. Allen, start. 
star six to unmute. All right. I'm wondering if anybody's here. Dana, local 22. Andrew, Caledonian record. Yes, I, I'm here. It looks like I've got plenty of time for questions. Huh? <laughs> the gold star for unmuting. Uh, very good. Uh, well, I have a quick one for Secretary Moore, if I could. Um, I know that with the sports guidance, you've tried to have recreational guidance be in line with the uh, with the school-based guidance. I'm particularly interested in spectators at indoor events. Are you going to adjust the recreational guidance to um, to eliminate the ability of people to um, to watch uh, youth sports games, indoor youth sports games? Uh, so the, the recreational sports guidance, an updated version of that was released uh, a week ago Monday, and it includes restrictions on spectators as well. It's slightly less restrictive than the school-based sports guidance, in part because schools um, under the Agency of Education Safe and Healthy Restart um, document are discouraged from allowing any visitors into their school buildings. Uh, so the recreational sports guidance provides for, for one adult um, or one family member uh, to accompany a child or children participating in a sports activity. Um, it discourages that to the extent possible, um, but, but does make that allowance. And again, there, there is that connection where it recognizes um, to the extent school facilities are being used uh, for recreational sports programs that the, the recreational sports program will need to follow the school-based guidance. Okay, so uh, you envision that one parent per child um, staying in effect at least for the time being for the recreational sports? Correct, and, and just to be clear, it's one parent per family, so that if, if there was a, a parent with more than one child participating, it would still be one, one, one adult, even for those multiple children. Okay, uh, and then um, a couple of questions for Dr. Levine. Um, uh, heading into cold season, um, and I know anecdotally that there's um, more symptoms floating around in the community, sniffles and the occasional cough. Um, I'm wondering, what is the guidance for when people should um, reach out to their primary health uh, care provider and contemplate a test? Um, is, is any single symptom enough to, to, um, to do that? Or are there parameters that people should still follow? Well, I, that's a great question, because as you know, when you look at the list of potential symptoms one can have from COVID, uh, there's a lot of overlap with a whole bunch of winter illnesses. Um, so um, we have a pretty low threshold at this point in time for um, having a test, especially if it really involves somebody uh, not able to go to a work site and they have no other way to to work other than to be present physically there. Um, so uh, it's often a judgment call. So it would be, it would be the same kind of call you would make to the, your uh, healthcare provider regarding your symptoms, just questioning what should I do um, and see if the response is you should get a COVID test versus why don't you take this allergy medicine because it sounds like you're having uh, a flare-up of your respiratory allergies. So it's individualized, but um, uh, I would just seek the, the, the appropriate guidance for that. And is there any differentiation between um, uh, symptoms with adults versus symptoms with kids? Um, I mean, I know, I know schools require, if, you, if you're symptomatic, that, that you don't attend in person, but say you've got a little one home because they've got a runny nose, should you just wait out that runny nose or should yeah. you think about um, going to your pediatrician and, and requesting a test? Right. So there is guidance in, in our school guidance and what, what we've given with uh, the pediatrics community that has to do with symptoms just like you mentioned, some of which can be uh, watched for a day or two uh, versus um, get a COVID test necessarily for that child. Some of it still has to do with what we're seeing in this specific community that 
the child is present in, whether it's the school community or the greater community around them, and uh, what their pediatrician is experiencing in terms of uh, the patients that they've been seeing. Um, so it's again going to be up to judgment, but we, we, we do have guidance out there in both areas to make sure that people understand that the first day of a runny nose does not necessarily mean uh, every young child is sent for a COVID test um, and there's flexibility in that guidance. But again, uh, not being so flexible that we're going to just miss cases that could be important to the classmates in that school. Uh, so always, always being um, erring on the side of doing more, not less. Okay. Um, so uh, I think that's all I just for general purpose guidance, if you if you have symptoms, uh, one or two from the list that last more than a day or two, should, is that the point where you should start calling your your primary health care provider? Uh, for an adult, you're referring to predominantly. I not about both. It seems like we have plenty of time. So. <laughs> So the answer is probably yes. If you've got a couple of symptoms that could be COVID symptoms, uh, you're already symptomatic, so that would be the ideal time to get tested. So I would um, definitely uh, suggest that at that point. And what's the average turnaround time for a test? Um, yeah. I've heard from one person who traveled and got the seventh-day test, um, the, it's now been five days and they're still waiting on getting their responses. Is that typical? Or? Yeah, the, rate, the, the latest data that we have is uh, still, I think, a maximum of 48 hours. Um, and that's across, I believe, five laboratories, uh, both in-state and out-state. Uh, but that, again, may not account for every place that a test is sent. Uh, so that individual may have had a bad experience, but um, we've been actually tracking this and feeling quite positive. And the 48 hours, does that account for the majority of tests that are administered in the state? Or yes. is it different between the pop-ups and state run versus getting it um, at, say, a hospital or a, or a healthcare provider? No, that accounts for the majority of tests, including the ones run in the state lab, the ones run in conjunction with UVM Medical Center, the ones sent to Broad, and the ones sent to several of the commercial laboratories. And uh, I've just, been, right, I've just been handed uh, some extra data. Um, it also includes Dartmouth and some of our hospitals within the state who do their own testing. So the turnaround has been uh, pretty uniformly uh, on target. Sorry the person you are aware of did not have such a good experience. Okay. I guess that's all the time I can burn. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> all right. I think that concludes everything. I'm, I'm, I'm told that concludes the number of uh, questioners. Uh, thank you all. Um, I know we all looked really good today, but we will definitely have the governor back on Friday. <laughs>